Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I coordinate the Cornell Forest Connect program, which includes this monthly webinar. We've been doing this now for several years. I long exhausted my, my list of presentations, which is nice because now we can host uh, really fabulous scientists and speakers and people doing some very cool stuff um, in forest and forest systems. And today we are uh, continuing with that pattern. We're joined by Dr. Colin Beyer. Colin is an associate professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And he does, he's got a broad background in forest ecology and ecosystem sciences. And one of the things that he's been working on and uh, he launched was the Climate and Applied Forest Research Institute, which is a now a joint venture between SUNY ESF and Cornell CALS and DEC and others. And uh, Colin's been doing some cool stuff with uh, mapping and monitoring carbon in New York. And he gave a, a presentation a little over about a year and a half ago. And so this is some new information, a little bit of an update, but I wanna welcome Colin back. He does a, a great job and uh, Colin, it's all yours. I'll just stay muted and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Peter. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I've got a lot to share with you today, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, many of you may be aware of, um, I'll see if we can get this to behave. Okay, the, the New York State passed a pretty ambitious uh, piece of climate legislation in 2019 called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or as we know it, CLCPA. Um, and, and one of the key pieces of that legislation was to achieve a net zero um, economy uh, by 2050. Uh, and this is a, a, one of the most ambitious uh, targets in climate legislation that exists worldwide. Um, that net zero by 2050, when you break it down, um, the, the scoping plan for this legislation is looking at about an 85% emissions reduction. And then the remaining 15% um, of the emissions, and this is benchmarked to 1990 levels, by the way, um, is going to be functionally offset uh, by some um, carbon removals from the atmosphere. And the legislation and the scoping plan is primarily leaning on the state's forest lands or natural and working lands to achieve these functional offsets um, through forest sequestration and storage. And so I wanna set the stage here um, of the work that we're doing and, and why we think the, uh, the work we're doing is, is, is going to fit this, the, this challenge that we have in New York. Um, 15% repre represents these hard to decarbonize sectors, portions of building sectors, you might imagine New York City, um, some of the transportation sectors. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to fly on an electric 70, 747 anytime soon. Um, you know, and, and other sectors of the economy, including manufacturing. Um, roughly speaking, this is about 60 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent each year. We've got to reach that offset, uh, that 15% um, by 2050 and keep it there. Um, so it's not just getting there and giving up, but we've got to keep it there. Based on the FIA's program reporting, that's the Forest Inventory and Analysis, who does the, the state level reporting to the EPA. Um, the forest carbon sink in New York State, this is basically the net uh, reduction of, of atmospheric carbon by forest lands. The forest carbon sink is roughly about half the size that, that we need it to be by 2050. Um, and, and it has been shrinking gradually um, since 1990. And that's been largely, or it's believed to be largely due to forest conversions to other land uses. Um, New York state is about 60% forested, depending on how you define forest lands. Um, most of this, uh, over 80% of it is in small private non-industrial parcels. Um, and many of our forests are facing challenges due to pests, diseases, um, deer populations over browsing, invasives, some of the legacies of past land use, the legacies of acid rain, you name it. Um, we're asking New York State's forests to do a big job at, at a time when they are um, 
growing back, but also growing back um, and facing a lot of challenges. Um, the the way that this is thought to happen is through you know these forest based climate solutions. Um, and the three primary strategies here are to add new forest lands through reforestation. That may also include afforestation, um, the avoided forest conversion, which is basically playing defense, uh, not allowing forest lands to be converted to other uses. Um, and then through a very broad category of natural forest management or improved forest management or enhanced forest management, you've seen it in a few different ways potentially. Um, to try to enhance the carbon benefits on working forest lands and help forests adapt to the changing environment. The, the, the issue that, that we have um, and, that, and, and that almost everybody else has is that we have a state level estimate um, and, and that gives us a sense of where we are at a high level, but it doesn't really help us implement or come up with strategies for actually figuring out how to reach this goal of growing and sustaining the forest carbon sink in New York State. Um, and so our goal was to build a map-based carbon accounting system for natural and working lands across New York for a variety of purposes, but three primary ones was to support policy and regulatory decision-making, to provide monitoring, reporting, and verification or MMRV capabilities and to inform forest stewardship practices and support landowners in making decisions that are right for them and that are aligned with some of the goals, uh, both public and private sector programs. So, you know, the Forest Service, again, reports these state level estimates of forest carbon stocks and changes. They estimate the, 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 the stock of carbon each year and then look at how that's changing from year to year. Um, to estimate whether the carbon sink is growing, which means it's 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 removing more CO2 from the atmosphere than it's putting back in, or if it's shrinking, um, and and this is based on their analysis of of over 5,500 plots across New York State, which are remeasured every seven years. This is really the National Forest Inventory, and what FIA does is really the gold, if not platinum, standard worldwide. Um, no offense to friends in Canada and elsewhere, which they also have an excellent system. Um, the, the, the plot network and the carbon accounting methods are amongst the world's most technically advanced. But the state level summaries, when you have a single number aggregated up to a state, they really don't offer much actionable information at the scales relevant for decision making. Um, they don't provide us much insights on where, how, why the forest carbon sink has been changing and likely will change in the future. And so in order to actually meet this challenge that we have in New York State and the challenge that exists elsewhere, um, we need better information or we need augmented information to be able to really uh, make decisions and, and, and move forward in, in a way that, that reaches or at least moves towards our goals. So the whole idea of this work is to bring the accounting, um, is to bring the assessment and accounting and all the other pieces that come with it into a map space. Um, and so our four kind of objectives here was to develop a statewide map-based inventory, current and historical biomass and carbon stocks, apply those historical maps um, in a stock change framework. And, and as I mentioned before, that's how the carbon accounting is typically done and certainly done by FIA um, to estimate sequestration and emissions. Um, efficiently track ongoing carbon stock changes and land use land cover changes uh, for statewide monitoring, reporting, and verification, and to be able to forecast a baseline or a future baseline for sequestration emissions and the overall climate benefits across the landscape under a variety of scenarios. Um, and so in getting into this work, you know, I'm going to share with you a very high-level overview of, of what we've done with a real focus on the ends as opposed to the means um, could spend a great deal of time wading into the details of the modeling work and a lot of these other pieces, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. I'm happy to answer those questions and I'm happy to follow up in great detail um, if there's interest or with anyone who has those questions. Um, one way of expressing this, and particularly one way that we share a lot of times with policymakers, um, nice colorful, um, you know, images, um, is is that we are really 
the basis of this work is to generate statewide annual and 30 meter resolution maps of vegetation biomass and forest carbon stocks. And then those maps are going into a variety of workflows, including a carbon accounting workflow that generates IPCC and FIA kind of compliant information, um, but, but generates this at a variety of scales and produces something that is relevant at parcel scales um, where decisions are, are going to be made. Our approach is really a daisy chain of models. Um, and I'll say, you know, as a, as a forest ecologist and as someone who does a lot of modeling, but also does a lot of field work, there's a certain level of caution and there's a certain level of discomfort that I have on my own, just based on my training, um, to, to be modeling on models on models. Um, and one of the things that I want to stress about all of this work is that at every point possible, we are checking ourselves and checking our outputs and checking our products and checking our methodologies to be as consistent with um, or to evaluate the consistency with field information. Um, but as I think you, you all can understand, you know, the, the, that when we have individual plots out there sampling the landscape, that's a very powerful way of understanding the landscape, but it's not uh, a powerful way of really being able to map it. Um, and, and the detailed information that exists between the plots is, has been our goal. So the idea here is to map, you know, current forest biomass um, and be able to map historical forest biomass. We need to understand what happened in the recent past. That's necessary for a stock change methodology to be achieved. It's also helpful for insights based on things that worked or things that maybe didn't work. Um, what were the outcomes of different management and land use practices with respect to this kind of carbon bottom line? Um, we need to convert those biomass estimates to carbon. Um, estimates and the reason why we're modeling biomass is that it's something that's much more directly um, achievable with a combination of field inventory and remote sensing. But we do need to convert those biomass estimates to carbon pools. Um, once we have a layer uh, layers of annual maps um, together and they all line up together, um, then we can do a stock change analysis as we look at uh, that series of maps through time. And all of that feeds into accounting, um, monitoring, and forecasting, as I'll explain um, in this talk. So starting off, uh, modeling current biomass, um, we are relying uh, initially on forest inventory and analysis uh, data from across the state. Um, and we have the, the plot locations, um, and, and we're able to look at how um, data sources like large footprint airborne LIDAR, um, as well as Landsat imagery and, and other sources overlap with those plots and train machine learning models um, to map above ground biomass or AGB um, uh, at 30 meters. And in this case, I'm showing you um, just a, a visualization of, of the LIDAR uh, point cloud um, for a given FIA plot or macro plot. Um, as I mentioned, we're always evaluating the agreement between our map surfaces or the map predictions that we make with FIA estimates in several different ways and at several different scales um, so that we have a sense of error and uncertainty um, of these map products. And that's helpful for us internally to continue to refine these models. It's also critical to be able to express to everyone um, how confident we are in different aspects of the data that we produce, what scales we feel like it's best used at, uh, and, and just overall to give a sense of, of, um, of how this information can be helpful. So LIDAR is incredibly powerful, I think as most everyone know, has learned um, and, and has realized over the years because it's mapping the landscape in three dimensions. And this provides a tremendous amount of information and much more information typically than imagery can provide um, in terms of being able to assess carbon stocks th through the structure of the forest. Um, and, and it's really, again, through assessing the biomass and then being able to translate that into carbon. Um, when you're able to combine ortho imagery and this three-dimensional modeling with LIDAR, it, it's just a tremendous resource of information um, that can be tapped into to provide 
a, a really robust basis for modeling. Um, in New York State, unfortunately, we don't have this patchwork of LIDAR. Our neighbors to the south in Pennsylvania have been way ahead of us on this, doing statewide LIDAR flights roughly every decade. Uh, at least I think they've completed two rotations of this. Um, in New York, we have this patchwork. Very recently, some of the white areas in here have actually been filled with LIDAR that was delayed quite a while. Um, but we still have a patchwork of different areas, puzzle pieces, different pieces in time. And that poses a number of challenges just to being able to compile all this information, um, which we've done ultimately to produce maps of this character here, which is showing a portion of the Adirondacks, including Lake George. This is kind of southeastern Adirondacks um, and much of the Hudson River uh, watershed or the headwaters of the Hudson River. Um, to be able to produce maps uh, of, a, of a forested landscape um, like the Adirondacks. Um, and these maps show pretty much everything in green on a scale of, of estimated above ground biomass, but it's also highlighting water and developed um, and some barren areas, just a little bit of these barren areas in the very top of this map in the high peaks of the Adirondacks. They're not really barren, um, but they're classified that way. Um, we can map other portions of the landscape that are very different kinds of landscapes, including uh, the map on the furthest left here, which is portions of Cayuga and Oswego County, including portions of the Finger Lakes, as you see, very heavily fragmented forest landscape, um, portions of, you know, the southwestern New York and the lower Hudson Valley in the bottom right. Um, and so these, again, are 30 meter resolution maps, and we have basically overlaid land use land cover classifications um, from the LC map product um, and uh, to, to be able to kind of mask out some of the areas that we're really not intending to model, although I'll get to some of the developed the red areas in a minute. So our current patchwork of LIDAR AGB maps, I actually have a, now a statewide patchwork with the exception of portions of Hamilton County where the LIDAR data was faulty. Um, Hamilton County is the big chunk in the northern part of New York um, there in the Adirondacks that's missing. Uh, but the LIDAR maps are really good because they're accurate. They're, they're, they're quite accurate. Um, and when we compare them back to FIA, um, when we compare our maps to these hexagons that FIA produces, um, and they, they use their sample plots to make an estimate of of biomass and carbon stocks within these hexagons, um, the models that we produced with LIDAR agree with them over 90% of the time. Um, so essentially this plot on the right is just showing this kind of uh, this gray caterpillar uh, of these confidence intervals around FIA's estimates and our, the orange dots are our estimates at that hexagon level. And this is the closest kind of map-based comparison that we can make with FIA. Um, there's a number of assumptions on both sides, but this overall shows that we're we're getting pretty close to FIA, which makes sense um, given that the, the the field data that we've relied upon entirely has been FIA. But going through the modeling process and translating this um, into contiguous wall-to-wall -wall maps, being able to show that there's a, a good level of agreement here is helpful. The problem with the LIDAR estimates is not only are they incomplete, but they just give us this kind of mingled patchwork of snapshots in time. They don't give us a historical perspective. We need that historical perspective for a variety of reasons, but most urgently or most fundamentally to provide a stock change analysis, which gives us a sense of whether the, the carbon stocks are growing or whether they're shrinking and, and where they're growing and where they're shrinking and at what rates and and then ultimately to use that information to learn more about why and how things are changing. Um, I just wanna mention quickly that in some cases, our model might be closer to reality than FIA in some of these areas where we're missing the caterpillar, where we where we've missed the mark, um, because LIDAR sees woody biomass, such as shrubs and other small trees that FIA will not measure as trees or FIA will, will when they go to measure the plot, they might not, it might not meet their definition of forest land. And so they may not measure um, in that subplot. Um, but we, what we, this, this highlights an issue that we continue to face and that we're working to address um, is that we don't have a lot of training data at low biomass levels. And that's fundamentally because 
um, because FIA is our training data. And if they go into a plot that doesn't meet that forest definition, um, they don't measure it. And so then they have an AGB of zero for that plot, um, but the LIDAR is picking up vegetation. So this is an ongoing challenge that we're working with. But we need historical biomass estimates. We need historical maps. Um, and the only way to really do that, the only remote sensing source that, that, that we can do that with is Landsat, uh, which actually goes back into the mid eighties. Um, we are mapping back to 1990 um, because that is the benchmark emissions year for the climate legislation in New York state. Um, and, and that gives us um, a few years of Landsat for different kinds of modeling and algorithm run-ups um, so that we have good data starting in 1990. Essentially what we did was we, we had a, a two-pronged approach. Um, we trained Landsat information directly on the FIA plot locations, which we call a direct approach. We also trained Landsat information on our Li LIDAR biomass surfaces. So you're sampling pixels. Um, and that was what we'd call an indirect approach. And some other folks um, in the Pacific Northwest have used this approach as well. Um, we combined the, the direct and indirect models into an ensemble um, to get the best parts of both models um, to make an ensemble prediction. So we essentially have this hybrid model that's combining LIDAR information and Landsat information. And because the, land, the, the predictors are primarily Landsat based, we can create a map for every year that Landsat has information. And so we can go back to 1990. We can also, and, and for the entire state, because the imagery covers the whole state. And as I'll mention later, we can also use the same models to ingest new Landsat information, new imagery as it becomes available and, and use this as the basis for monitoring the landscape going forward. So here again is the LIDAR AGB surface. We used portions of these surfaces that we had, the, these maps, um, to, to train models that are based on Landsat. And I'm showing you older maps in both cases. We have some updated products, but this gets across the point that the LIDAR AGB surface looks like this for the same area. The Landsat AGB surface looks like this. There are definitely some differences and some systematic as well as random um, biases or differences between these maps that we've explored in some depth. Um, but overall, you know, what we run into with Landsat is there's a saturation threshold. Um, and this, this exists for any of these models. And what a saturation threshold is, is just a fancy way of saying that we can't, our models cannot predict above a false ceiling. The, the false ceiling being they can't get to the maximum value of the training data that they were given. So the highest AGB value of any plot in New York State was approximately 425 metric tons per hectare. And that's actually in southwestern New York and Allegheny State Park. It's a single plot. The next highest plot is about 340 metric tons per hectare. Um, but but our models saturate. So the LIDAR model saturates at about 300 metric tons per hectare about less than 1% of New York state forest land um, is, is above that level. Um, our Landsat models saturate at 225 metric tons per hectare, which is about 4% of New York state. Um, there's just less information in the imagery as there is in the, in the LIDAR. And so what we did was there were strengths and weaknesses of both the LIDAR-based and the Landsat-based models. And essentially what we did was combine them into an ensemble for prediction. And the idea of an ensemble is again, that it, that, it, that it brings together hopefully the best parts of both models and you're kind of averaging them together so that you get some of the, the, the features of both that are beneficial. The LIDAR models capture a lot of spatial patterns that the Landsat doesn't. And, and we know from looking at areas that we know well that the LIDAR does a better job of that. It also doesn't saturate as highly. But the Landsat models, in some ways, are more accurate when it comes to predicting the AGB level at a given plot location. When we, we did a lot of work tweaking these ensembles um, and adjusting them, and we're able to achieve nearly the same accuracy in comparing back to the FIA small area estimates, these, these 60,000 hectare hexagons, um, we're at about 87% agreement there. So, we're able to produce models that are pretty close 
Um, and But the advantage of these models is that they go back in time. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is this landscape that we've looked at already, um, but it's we're walking through time. And if you look at the upper left there above the map, the target is indicating the year that we're that, that of the map. So I've stacked all these maps together and we're just scrolling through them in an animation. So we've reset back to 1990 again. Um, so we're able to recreate this dynamic landscape in the context of above ground biomass. And as I'll mention, we're converting that into carbon. Um, uh, and so that we can essentially do the same thing for looking at carbon stocks over time and space at a pretty high resolution. Um, when I've shown these maps and these movies to various partners and folks, particularly those um, in the, uh, the industrial forest landowners, many of them um, have been able to pick out specific operations and harvests. Um, and so we've gotten a lot of good feedback on these being valid. The one other thing I'll mention, and this is something that you're gonna see in multiple places when I show you these movies, as we get to 2006 and seven now, you notice the whole map lightens up and then darkens again. Um, this is something that we thought was a problem with our models or with the Landsat data, but it actually turns out that this is a forest health issue. And I'll get to that in a minute. Zooming in to a working forest, something a little bit more relevant. This is the Upper Hudson Woodlands um, in the Adirondack Park. Um, over time, you see the road passing through this area. Land changed hands in 2010. And there was a significant amount of harvesting that took place at that point in time. This used to be Finch Prine land, um, and it's now managed by F&W Forestry and Timberlink. Um, and they've shared, um, they've been very generous in being the first out of the box to share harvest records and things with us. But this is based entirely on the models that we produced and were able to track um, over time these changes in forest carbon or forest biomass, which again, will give us insights on forest carbon changes. And you can see the, the growth here, you can see the harvest, and you can see the regeneration. Now, this rate of regeneration is probably overestimated, especially in the first 10 years after harvest. This is another issue I won't wade into too, too much, but it's an issue that we talk about in terms of this: the, it, the forest greens up post-harvest before it grows up. And so the, the re-greening of the ground um, relative to the previous pre-harvest canopy greenness happens pretty quickly, but as we all know, the biomass does not accumulate that quickly. We know at about year 20, the rate of biomass accumulation of our models matches that um, of, of the data that's available. Um, and so one of the things that we need to work on is adjusting some of the regeneration. Uh, but overall, it's capturing plausible patterns over space and time. Uh, from working for us. A static look at this and zooming in further into some of these harvest units. Um, each one of these maps is just going from 2011 annually to 2018, showing these different harvest units, the solid lines being clear, small clear cuts, the uh, dashed, li dashed dotted lines being shelter wood harvest. And if you look in the upper left in 2011, you can see this is a pre-harvest condition. And then the harvest that took place between uh, 2012 and 2013, at least those clear cuts, and then the shelter woods that were put in a few years later. And you can see that we can track this both in the map space and then summarize our maps to provide a chart of this over time. And you can look at the, the increasing, you know, uh, AGB post-harvest as a reflection of relative sequestration rates on the ground. Um, and so the sharing of harvest records with us has been really valuable in a variety of ways, especially with change detection and, and tuning better change detection tools. And those tools factor into the models that I'm showing you. And so there's a lot of pieces to this, but ultimately we feel pretty good about the ability to, to track what's going on um, on the landscape. This overall leads to statewide above ground biomass trends and historical patterns. On the left-hand side, just showing a summary of the AGB estimates statewide um, as a mean of metric tons per hectare and by different cover types. Um, I, I think I noted before, but I'll mention again that we map biomass across the entire state using this approach. And then we've removed certain parts of the map that are developed 
you know, otherwise, but we have not been um, limited strictly to forest lands for biomass because there's so many marginal lands and so many other conditions out there. Um, what what we can see is when we when we do convert this to carbon, we do focus just on forest lands, but even then, we've included tree cover, wetlands, and and shrubs um, in our more inclusive definition of forest land. Uh, for a variety of reasons to for decision support purposes. But any of this is very easily adjustable to just strictly look at tree cover or strictly look at other, other cover types. Again, I want to highlight these areas here. You can see the lightning and we kind of skip past it, but we'll let it roll around one more time. And I want you to focus in on, and I'll give you a warning, but particularly in the 2006 and 2007, we see this large scale kind of lightning of the map um, and this is not actually a biomass loss. Um, and this is, again, an adjustment that we can make. Um, but this is related to forest health, as I'll show in a moment. So then we have to convert these biomass estimates to carbon. And this is, again, based on relationships between biomass measurements and carbon pool measurements um, at the FIA plot level. Um, and there are five carbon pools that IPCC and FIA recognize above ground carbon, below ground carbon, that's basically your live carbon in vegetation. Um, then there's dead wood, litter, and soil. And uh, soil, of course, being the usually about as large, if not larger than all other pools combined. Of course, soil is also the one we know the least about and the one that poses a tremendous number of challenges because of fundamental knowledge gaps um, and and so much more work is 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 needed in this space, and a lot of great initiatives are moving forward on a variety of fronts there. But we still have done our best to map these forest carbon pools again at 30 meters at an annual basis statewide from 1990 to 2019. And as with um, every all of our other map products, we are evaluating the accuracy and the level of agreement between those maps and FIA est estimates at multiple scales. Just quickly, you know, the FIA program um, has their phase two plots, um, uh, which are their standard plots, and then about one out of every 16 plots, at least in New York State, is a phase three plot, and that incl includes more intensive measurements of soil, litter, and deadwood, um, and giving some estimates of those carbon pools. And that data provides a basis to relate those estimates to other plot level data, such as AGB. Um, we use two approaches to convert our estimates of biomass to carbon pool estimates. Um, for the live carbon, um, we use allometrics. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of if we're estimating the above ground uh, dry biomass um, that's there, we can use an allometric conversion. Um, derived based on uh, forest types and so forth uh, from FIA um, to, to estimate the live carbon stocks. Um, we, for the other soil carbon, the soil litter and deadwood pools, we needed to train new models. Um, and we have much less traction with those models than, so we have a lot more confidence in our live carbon estimates than we do in some of these other estimates, particularly soil. And again, soil is a very tricky wicket. Um, or sticky wicket or whatever uh, euphemism you want to use. So just to illustrate here, um, note that the scale in these maps goes well above 300, um, because as I'm going to show you in a minute, um, the, the, it's meant to accommodate the full range of, of, of all of the pools. So here, you don't see as much variation in our AGB map, and, and then the AGC map is roughly half of the AGB map on that same color scale. Um, but when we use AGB to estimate soil carbon, we include a lot of other geospatial variables that are honestly more important than AGB for making this prediction. And those are variables like slope and aspect, um, topographic wetness index. Um, we use some soil mapping information that's at a pretty coarse scale, um, but we have some other variables that are included. And the soil carbon maps that we're able to produce are pretty pretty good, um, but they're not necessarily um, as good as we'd like them to be. Um, and so what this is showing is a, a higher level of soil carbon, particularly in some of our conifer forests and like in the high peaks of the Adirondacks, which is kind of in the northern edge of the um, of the map shown here on the right. 
Based on this, we can produce statewide total forest carbon stock estimates. And the main map here is showing where we have now um, just estimated carbon stocks for what we consider our working de definition of forest land, which includes tree cover, it includes wetlands, and in includes shrub and grass covered areas. Obviously, grass is not forest, but there are a lot of shrubby areas and, and, and shrubs invading forest edges. There's a lot of old fields, and I'll talk about this more. And these are sites where there's some marginal forest regeneration and other things taking place. They're also important areas um, for potential reforestation and or other types of climate solutions to be implemented. Um, this is just showing some different zooms of some different portions of the state. But that statewide map in orange is showing croplands, and red is showing developed, and blue is showing water. Um, everything else, we we pretty much have have made an estimate um, of forest carbon stocks, but we can narrow down the map um, to just tree cover, and we can tweak all of those things depending on different applications. As I showed before, we stack all these maps together, and then we can do a time series analysis of these maps in GIS. Um, be, because all the pixels line up with each other, they all line up. They're all 30 meter Landsat pixels. All the all the products that we produce, all the pixel geometries line up perfectly. So you don't have these mixels or mixed pixels, and it's all one to one. We can do basic operations like a raster subtraction, where it's just the net biomass change between two points in time. Um, we can do more sophisticated trend analyses with statistical tests at the individual pixel level to estimate growth rates. Um, we can also look at, use other tools to segment that time series and identify not only the timing of different disturbances, but what the percent loss to disturbance would have been um, at that time uh, that, that these disturbances took place. So there's a lot of power in this approach um, to be able to look at the spatial and temporal patterns of change. When we look at live carbon stock changes for all of New York State, um, again, this map is showing kind of as you head toward the kind of bluish green. Um, these are increases in, in live carbon stock change. Um, and the brown is showing decreases over this time. This is a very simple high level estimate of what changed over 30 years. Um, and some of the zooms will show you know, that you could see some of these patterns at a pretty detailed level. And in some cases you can actually pick out um, working forest parcels surrounded by reserves, um, which is the case for the, the the inset that's in the upper left that actually refers to a portion of the Adirondacks. Um, we can also see some of the most um, rapid growth and increases in biomass have been along the eastern fringe of the Catskills Park over the last 30 years. Um, I want to note that this does not incorporate yet the life cycle carbon benefits of harvested wood products. Um, and there are substantial benefits to those products, but there's a tremendous amount of detail and complexity that we have to be able to capture. And so this is something that we're working on. We have some, some new projects underway in CAFRI um, and some things that we're working on to be able to better implement or better in the carbon accounting process um, that these kinds of maps are fed into the carbon accounting process to be able to identify harvests and to be able to make our best estimate for what the carbon benefits of those harvested wood products are so that they're not just treated as emissions. And that's very important. Just to zoom in in a few places, again, Adirondack Park and Catskills Park. Uh, many of you may know, some of you don't. Adirondack Park is a blend of, of public and private land. Um, here you can see a parcel um, of one of our industrial forest landowners in the Adirondack Park that's been pretty heavily managed over the last 10 years. The biomass has not had a chance to recover. Um, it is regenerating, and we can confirm that with other change detection work that we're doing. Um, I've also been there a number of times, and I can confirm there's regeneration. Um, but this, this stock change says that there's less carbon um, on the land in 2019 than there was in 1990. Um, and you can make out the parcel boundaries just from our map. Um, and, and although we have all the tax parcel information and we use it as I'll show you, um, we don't necessarily need it um, in some cases to draw inferences from our maps and also just to kind of qualitatively validate our maps. All of this goes into 
statewide applications and fundamentally we need applications for accounting and we need applications for monitoring going forward. And so our goal was to, to build a system for MMRV, monitoring, measurement, reporting, and verification. Um, in this first iteration of what we've built, essentially we're using the same models um, and, and workflows and computational tools as we did uh, for the historical mapping that I've shown you. We're just ingesting new Landsat information to make annual updates. And then every five to seven years, as a new panel of FIA data is released, we can retrain models um, based on that new FIA information. Um, but our version, our first version here, our first tool is functional. Our, the system is operational and it's based entirely on free data and open source tools. Um, so this is expandable, you know, um, applicable to other areas. Um, and, and certainly there's a lot of work to be done to be able to build the models underneath this, but, but this is not proprietary. Um, this is something that can be open and transparent in a lot of ways. And it provides parcel level information, as I'll show in a moment, that's also statewide. So there's a big picture, but also a very fine grained uh, capability to this for forest carbon monitoring, reporting and verification, and a number of related applications. Basically, the idea here is we built historical stacks of maps, we have a sense of the current uh, situation, and then we can monitor each year, roughly in near real time, we can usually get the Landsat information from the previous year um, and, and have an updated uh, map of the current year before that current year is over. So, for example, 2022, the Landsat uh, imagery from 2022 hasn't been incorporated into the collection that we use. It's not available yet. It should be available by the fall. And we can process this with our workflow to have an estimate of what happened in 2022, basically a 2022 map to add to our stack by the end of 2023. Um, so it's it's not real time, but I think it's close. Um, and again, this is based on the National Forest Inventory. It's based on Landsat. You know, FIA and Landsat are our cornerstone, right? Federal programs of the Forest Service and NASA. These are pretty reliable things that we expect to continue in the future. And so we've tried to avoid contingencies of of many other data sets including spaceborne LIDAR and other things that are really cool and, and offer a lot of potential, but we don't know how long those programs are gonna last. So we've tried to build on something that we think is very reliable. And again, we're using all open source tools and particularly Google Earth Engine, which is an ex exceptionally valuable tool um, and, and, and has helped us with capacity building. So again, MMRV tracking progress and verifying benefits of forest-based climate solutions. I'm just showing you again what we've seen here, the ability to, to both look statewide and to look at scales, uh, parcel level scales relevant for decision-making. In some cases, maybe even stand or compartment level scales. Um, th th this is you know, fundamentally valuable because we, we, instead of randomly selecting landowners or participants in a program, which is currently how almost everyone does this, to verify compliance with an offset or an easement or some other voluntary agreement or even compliance with a regulatory requirement, um, instead of randomly sending people out to audit, we now have a high level view of what's going on out there and we can pass you know, we, we, we have this filter and we can screen out landowners who, you know, where we don't think anything's changed versus where we observe something that might be um, in non in non-compliance with an agreement or a regulation. This gets into our forest change detection work. All of this is built in. You can see that we can detect forest change with our models and our outputs. Underlying this is 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 a tool. Um, that we that we selected after testing a bunch of tools. There's a paper in the Journal of Forestry last year where we ground truth several leading forest change detection tools and data sets in a portion of the Adirondacks that I've already kind of shown you a bit of. Um, and all of this, of course, happens. It would not happen without our industrial forest landowners very generously sharing maps and data and harvest records with us to be able to ground truth this on. What we found overall was these tools were not ready for prime time. 
especially when it comes to detecting partial harvests that are much more common in New York State than uh, clear-cut harvests. And, and so what we did was we, we took the best one, which is Land Trender, which also happens to be implemented on Google Earth Engine, and we tuned it using more harvest records, um, using image-based validation, and using field work. I had crew out last summer basically chasing pixels around in the, in the Adirondacks to determine, did a disturbance happen here as the model or as the tool suggested? Um, and our, our tuning for New York performs better on both working for us and reserves. Um, and it provides very cost efficient monitoring for a variety of applications. This just gives you a sense of some of the results. So, you know, this is showing the year of the greatest disturbance for this area. Um, Upper Hudson Woodlands is this working forest parcel I've shown you several times. Adjacent to it is ESF's Huntington Forest, um, our largest uh, forest property, about 15,000 acres. And then adjacent to that are reserve lands like the High Peak Wilderness, High Peaks Wilderness, part of the Forest Preserve. Um, we we are working with this kind of information um, to attribute forest change. So it's one thing to detect it. It's another thing to understand its causes. Um, and because of these very different patterns of change, um, we're using this to train models to identify harvest versus non-harvest disturbances. And by integrating forest health flyover information, we think we might also be able to parse out non-harvest disturbances into um, insects versus other causes. Um, this is a critical need for parcel scale monitoring as pests, diseases, extreme weather, a number of other challenges impact our forests. And again, none of this would be possible without partners F&W and, um, and, and with Lime Timber Company in the Adirondacks. Um, Lime is the largest private landowner in New York State. Um, so we have over 350,000 acres of working lands and records um, over the last 10 to 20 years to be able to tune this on, and this is extremely valuable. So to get to that blip I mentioned earlier in 2006, we're actually able to start to pull together some evidence that, that these tools can detect defoliation. There was pretty widespread defoliation in portions of New York, Adirondacks, Catskills, especially Tug Hill, um, in in 2006 and 2007, um, some of my my colleagues said, "Well, maybe it wasn't FTC; it might have been something else." Um, but what we're able to see here is that is that our detection tools can pick this up. And the reason why we know it's a defoliation, if you look on the right, what this is showing is the results of image based validation. And so it's a time series of imagery starting back in '85. And for each of those plots, they correspond to the points on the map. Um, and so this point-based image validation, we see this blip in 2006 where the greenness of the canopy dropped quite a lot. And then immediately it returned back or close to back to where it was before that um, in 2007, at least for these areas shown here. Um, a biomass loss, whether due to harvest or mortality or something along those lines would take a lot the, the the pattern here would look different. I mean, it wouldn't jump right back up immediately. So we've been working with DEC Forest Health in New York State, um, and we believe some of this can branch off into some early uh, warning uh, detection tools, particularly for hemlock woolly adelgid, um, as well as to be able to uh, identify defoliation and other events that are maybe not be causing as much mortality, but certainly are important to be able to capture. We also want to be able to capture this to be able to verify this was not an actual loss of biomass and not necessarily reflecting a loss of carbon. And so then we can do some adjustments to our models um, or to just the output data so that those little blips in there don't screw up the carbon accounting. We also have to be able to forecast the landscape going forward. This is to derive a reference level, a business as usual kind of reference level. Um, right now, we're doing this with statistical time series forecasting techniques, where we're training models on our first 30 years of data at the pixel level, and we're using that to make a forecast for the next 30 years. Um, so going from 2020 to 2050 and projecting the landscape. And trust me, those two maps are actually different. Um, <laughs> and 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 essentially, the, what we see is these maps um, or these forecasts, excuse me, carry forward recent trends um, in the data. 
And so it is kind of a past behavior gives you an, a sense of future performance, um, which we know is not really the truth. Um, but it is our best approximation at this stage. There's a lot of work that we want to do on this front, particularly being able to take existing like FVS or other model simulations with the Canadian Forest Service model under different silvicultural scenarios um, to be able to then impute them or, or bring them into this map space. Um, and this is this is work that I'm excited to help move forward with folks in both the US and Canada. Um, we're in very early stages of doing that. But this does give us a forecast. Um, and it gives us a forecast that's probably best interpreted as the potential carbon sequestration, probably conservative estimate, a potential future carbon sequestration under a business as usual scenario. One of the things that we can do and are doing in our carbon accounting process is we're basically incorporating future land use land cover change predictions based on other groups that have done the modeling for New York State into this so that we can identify where we think future land use land cover change is going to impact these carbon numbers because those have the real the greatest potential particularly to impact soil carbon pools and those that is the largest pool and that's really important for playing defense again avoiding deforestation so we have to translate these maps into carbon accounting we developed a workflow for doing that it's pretty stale it's pretty novel too so i'm not going to get into a lot of the details there but i'm happy to talk about it essentially we're taking time series maps of biomass carbon stocks land use bringing them all together in an IPCC methodology uh, for stock change. And the idea there is to output carbon accounting information. I've just borrowed liberally here from EPA reporting. I'm not promising that we're gonna be able to get to all of these lines, but the key ones on the left in terms of ecosystem pools and the, the five pools on the left there, um, we, we should be able to deal with. Um, although likely for the deadwood litter and soil pools we'll be holding those constant over time, um, with the exception of when land use change affects them. And that also replicates what FIA does, at least in New York State, just because of the lack of knowledge. We can summarize all of this by parcels. So I have a statewide tax parcel data set that gets updated every year. So it's pretty straightforward to take those parcel polygons, those parcel boundaries, and summarize our maps by them. I'm just showing you here for this portion of the Adirondacks and Lake George area. Um, the, the change in live carbon over the last 30 years by parcel, and then our estimate of the current carbon stocks for those same parcels. This is easy to do from a GIS perspective, and I think it provides an immediate decision support value for being able to screen and prioritize lands for easements, tax incentive programs, et cetera. Um, the hard part is estimating the accuracy or the uncertainty for small parcels and conveying that map uncertainty in fair and transparent ways to end users. The other challenge that we have, of course, is protecting a reasonable expectation of privacy. There's nothing confidential in these data fundamentally, um, but, but there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, but we also want to be able to share this information um, in, in the hopes that it will be valuable for a variety of purposes, both public sector and private sector, including being able to provide individual landowners with some high level maps and data that may be able to help them get off the ball in terms of working with a consulting forester, engaging with programs to, to be, you know, in the stewardship of their land uh, for, for the things that they care about and maybe potentially also in terms of climate. Likewise, we can do the same thing with our forecasts, um, forecast out, look at the changes that are forecasted, overlay that with our parcel maps, and then provide um, a parcel-based estimate of what we think the potential um, uh, carbon sequestration over the next 30 years is. We can incorporate map projections of land use land cover change, which in, in some cases are showing up as red here in the, in the maps on the far right, both above and below. Um, we can model outcomes of different policy and land use scenarios. So this gives us the basis to start to look at, okay, well, here we have a baseline. What if we do this? What if we do that? What are the outcomes? And where are the places um, that different types of practices make the most sense? Um, so again, screening and prioritizing um, for landowner engagement. 
Um, we've been working with the folks at the U.S. Army installation at Fort Drum to integrate carbon into their management planning. They've been um, ordered to inventory greenhouse gases to take steps to reduce the net emissions from the base ops. Like the rest of us, unlike the rest of us, they can't say no. Um, they want to be the tip of the spear on this thing. Um, and they have a great history of forest management and overall stewardship on this landscape. Um, just to highlight the airfield is here, the containment area with the barracks is here. This large area in the middle here is part of the base, but it's the impact area where all the missiles and bombs and, and things land and where we don't go. Um, <laughs> and so that's why there's a gap there. But this is showing live carbon now. Um, this is showing the changes in live carbon over the last 30 years. You can see some areas that have been managed. Um, this the next the next map is then showing the actual mean live sequestration rate, um, which is based on a trend analysis of the last 30 years, giving us a sense of the relative rates of forest growth and net sequestration. Um, and so again, here's the map uh, movie of um, Fort Drum and an assessment of carbon stocks over time. And again, there's some that. Some of that dip in 2006 is related to defoliation, but a lot of the changes that you're seeing here are related to land clearing and other things for tactical and training purposes, their primary mission. Um, they clear a lot of land and they create a lot of different type of vegetation conditions for training the 10th Mountain Division. Um, and so, so they can move the tanks and the APCs and so forth through those areas. Um, and you can also see in this the, the growth of the containment area and the airfield in the bottom left over time and kind of that growing red area as they expanded the airfield and the containment area. We have applications, you know, I mentioned all this marginal and transitional land, Peter and I were talking about it just before we started. Upstate New York is mostly a post-agricultural landscape and a lot of our old fields are not going through succession as we were all taught it would happen. We have invasive shrubs like buckthorn and honeysuckle, Russian olive, and others that are creating more persistent shrub scrub habitats that are novel ecosystems and cover types in New York for the most part. We do have gray dogwood and wetlands. We have a few other cases, but usually shrubby areas are transitional cover types um, in early successional forests, um, but not the case anymore. So we leveraged a lot of what we've been doing, combining LIDAR and Landsat to map low statured vegetation at the same 30 meter resolution. Uh, a conservative estimate based on these models is we have about one to one and a half million acres of these shrublands across New York State, where we are pretty confident that the long-term carbon benefits and other co-benefits of these lands are pretty limited relative to forests. Um, and they could be ideal sites, and they have been talked a lot about through the Climate Act scoping plan for reforestation, bioenergy crops, solar and wind facilities. So you're not knocking down existing forests for solar, which is happening everywhere in New York State, unfortunately, um, and silvopasture, a number of other things. Lastly, and I am almost done here, and I apologize for going a couple minutes over, and I'm obviously happy to stay and talk and answer questions beyond the hour. We initially assumed that our LIDAR models would not be very good in urban environments because they would pick up buildings and other aspects of the built environment and treat those as biomass. Um, what I'm showing you now is an area around Kingston, um, the lower Hudson River, um, where, where the green areas are where we've masked, the green areas are where we've made predictions. Um, uh, everything else is masked out because it's classified as developed land. Um, <laughs> When I actually remove the mask, um, it shows that we're actually picking up a lot of small pockets of urban tree cover and vegetation in these areas. And so I'll go back again and I'll do this back and forth a bit so you can see, particularly in this portion of, of Kingston, we're picking up a lot of small scale vegetation. Um, and so we think that these actually might be better than we originally suspected they would be. All we have to do is unmask the map, show the values that we estimated for these developed lands, and that could provide a starting point for urban and community forest planning. Very important for CLCPA to make sure that the benefits of um, climate stewardship are received across the state, but particularly by underserved uh, communities. There's a lot of challenges and solutions to this work, and I apologize for doing this, but I'm going to skip over them really quickly. I'm happy to touch on them 
uh, in follow-up, I just want to highlight that there's a lot of data products that are either available now or will be coming out in the next couple of months. Um, in this summer, we will be doing monitoring updates to add 2020 and 2021, and probably this or this fall and winter, we'll be adding 2022. Um, so a, a full demonstration of the monitoring platform. Um, but we have a lot of other products um, that, that are available now for New York State, and our model is to share them um, with public sector partners freely and with private sector partners through a data use agreement. Um, to make sure that the data isn't misused or misinterpreted. That's a lot to chew on. I really appreciate your attention. I hope I didn't lose everybody in going through all of that, um, but I'm happy to, of course, stick around and answer questions. There's a huge group of people that have been involved in this work um, and the, the, um, the key folks are shown here. Um, but thank you for your time and I'm happy to discuss and answer questions. Colin, great job. Thank you. That was really fun to see all the work you've done. And I'm just, I'm fascinated by how all that comes together. And, and uh, you, you take the, you know, as you pointed out, there's a lot of moving parts and to make it kind of meld together in a way that makes sense. And then you can also do uh, procedures of validation. So um, there was, I'll say a lot of kind of questions that came in so do you uh, can you see the chat window or do you want me to go back and read the questions or I can, yes i can see them let's see elizabeth triano asked related presentation is pdf yes i can share um i can share that as a pdf obviously the the animated stuff won't come through um the the slide deck is something I can share uh, upon request. Um, it's a big it's it's a big file, but we can find ways to share it. Um, and as Peter, as you mentioned, it's being recorded. Um, Patricia said that's a big loss of forest land in just five years. Um, I think the forest land that that we have lost has been a relatively small amount every year. Um, our estimates are for every three to four acres of forest land we've lost, we've gained forest land, but the problem is with carbon accounting, as soon as you lose forest land, it's kind of that carbon leaves that forest sector for accounting purposes. Um, and so you lose it immediately. Reforestation or new forest lands, it takes a significant amount of time for carbon to start to accumulate again. So there's kind of a built-in penalty. Even if the forest gains and losses in terms of land cover were equal, you would still have a net um, weakening of the carbon sink because of the way that the accounting is done. Um, let's see, hopefully that helps a bit. Um, but we, some of what we've done, which I didn't really share with you, is we've had to look at land use land cover change across the state because FIA's estimate of our shrinking carbon sink is largely based on their estimates of forest land cover change. And that is based primarily on their samples. And so if an FIA plot is converted from, from forest land to non-forest land, th that statistically in the statewide estimate means that a roughly 6,000 hectares of forest land was converted to non-forest land. Um, they use some other information to, to help kind of dial that in better. It's not quite that simple, but of course with maps and satellite information, we can estimate this more precisely. Um, Kay Conway asked citizen science aspects to the mapping. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we're designing a citizen science um, program for going out at, for our forest change detection and disturbance mapping for folks to be able to go out into the woods um, and to be able to do some kind of validation and more importantly, to learn about how forests experience change and that disturbance is a natural part of forests and that trees die and trees grow back, right? Um, but also to be able to um, do some validation of things we're seeing with the satellite imagery to be better stewards of the land. Um, let's see. Bruce Kernan asked, can the forest management plans DC is approving for private forest lands incorporate these data? They can, Bruce. Um, we're working towards that, working closely with DEC on a number of levels. Um, the, 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 
the New York Connects project that Peter and I are both involved in. This is a $60 million from USDA for Climate Smart Commodities. Um, the, the, the forest monitoring, reporting, and verification uh, tools that we're going to be using, and this is, you know, 60 million funding, about 40 million or so is going into the hands of landowners for climate smart ag and forestry. But what I've shown you today is the basis for the forestry MMRV that we're going to be doing. So this data could also be incorporated. There's no substitute for doing the field work, but this can be a good starting point for private landowners. Um, Elizabeth said most forests around here are second growth junk. That's kind of harsh, but I guess there's some truth to that. And does it matter for biomass whether the wild green is burning bush, barberry, norway, maple, more native? Um, that's a good point, Elizabeth. And, and from our standpoint, we are agnostic as to what the vegetation is that's making up the biomass. Um, uh, but some of the other work that we've done, including that shrubland mapping, is, is trying to pick out some of those areas where maybe we, we have fields full of invasives that aren't really going to progress into forests with, with our kind of usual sus set of suspects of, of, of late successional trees, the ones that are going to provide us with durable wood products and, and opportunities for sustainable forestry. Um, we're trying to pick out um, those areas a bit better. Um, and, and to help for decision support. Um, let's see, pixel size is 30 meters. Um, um, and thank you, Simon, for answering that question for me. Simon said, regarding farms reverting to forest land, this is a clear trend for a long time in New York State, starting in the 1800s. Data I've seen suggests a net increase in forest cover. This cost for many decades has stopped. We've been losing that tree and forest cover in New York State overall in the last 20 years. That's correct, Simon. And um, some of the analysis that we've done um, of land use land cover change over the last 30 years using another group's product, there's a product called LC Map, which is a, a CONUS wide land cover product. It's a 30, the same 30 meter pixels that we use. It's based on Landsat. It boils it down to just eight cover types instead of the dozens that NLCD, the National Land Cover Data Set, uses. Um, but the nice thing about LC map is that it's annual. Um, and so we can track these things consistently over time and we can incorporate that. And what we've seen, like I said, is about a three or four to one um, loss to gain ratio. And that's with a liberal definition of forest land, inclu including tree cover, wetlands and shrub and grasslands, um, because we've got to capture some of that shrubland and the LC map product doesn't parse between shrub and grass. Um, but yes, I think we can confirm um, from everything that we know that we have been losing forest land. It's been, it's, it's been a slow bleed. Um, but again, that, that you get a, a, it really hurts the carbon sink. And so if there's a first rule of all of this is we have to play defense, we really have to avoid deforestation. And one of the leading causes of deforestation in the last couple of years and going forward in the future looks to be solar farms. And that's something that we need to get, our, get around pretty quickly because um, we don't want the carbon debt created by clearing the forest to basically cancel out the climate benefits of solar. Um, uh, Robert Breen said, stock change analysis seems to be based on using historical data, basic trend analysis, models for projecting future conditions. I would, I, that, the historical data is being used to train a forecasting model, correct. Um, that is not my ideal approach, but it's it's the one that we were able to get um, traction on initially. Um, the stock change analysis is just based on looking at how the stocks change over time and using that as a proxy for whether, in this case, carbon stocks are increasing overall, which suggests, right, that indicates that more CO2 is being removed from the atmosphere for that given area than it's being put back. Um, or if the shrink stocks are shrinking, which would suggest the opposite. Um, you said FEMA's finding limits using historical data for modeling the future. Agreed. Yes, the future is, it's a moving target. Um, you know, and we, um, you said, is there an attempt to use anticipatory probabilistic approaches generating an array of future scenarios for generating futures uh, models for biomass and or climate disruption? Um, this is something that we, are working towards. Um, what I've shared with you today is the basis, the kind of foundation and the framework by which we would start to evaluate those scenarios. 
Um, and of course, as every year passes, as we get new information, we can incorporate that into our kind of knowledge base and into our modeling framework and, and hopefully refine those. But you're absolutely right that we need to use scenario analysis to explore the, the, the wide range of uncertainty in the future, and that you're absolutely right that past results don't guarantee future performance. Um, but right now, that's kind of the best that we can do, but we are definitely looking towards moving past that. Um, I'm not sure the question about the lichen plot. Um, that was when you were talking about the the phase three FIA. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, who's accounting for durable forest products? Gary Goff, great question. Um, we um, have done some, the, my colleagues in CAFRI have done some kind of back of the napkin assessment for DEC of the, the statewide kind of benefits of harvested wood products for New York um, to provide some numbers so that in the green in the annual greenhouse gas inventory for New York, um, the, 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 those, those numbers are not just being treated as emissions. We have a new project that's been funded by NYSERDA. It's getting underway very soon where we're really gonna be able to refine the life cycle analysis and the maps and data that I've shared with you today, some of that's gonna feed into that um, so that we can really look at a, a full life cycle of different harvest operations, where we think or where we can we know the wood is going, where it's ending up. And then we could not only estimate storage benefits, but also the substitution benefits of harvested wood products. The storage is, you know, the carbon's in the wood and it's not in the atmosphere. The substitution is when we're using wood or bioproducts in lieu of concrete, steel, and plastic, which have a huge greenhouse gas footprint. So the idea being, you know, mass timber construction, um, biomaterials, these things have some substitution benefits. And so we do have a new project underway with CAFRI uh, with support from NYSERDA um, to, to really being able to account for that full carbon life cycle for a different um, products and with a real focus on forest products. Um, Ron Gamble asks, when you say small parcels, what size in hectares do you mean? That's a great question. Um, roughly speaking, Ron, we feel pretty good about our data for anything 10 acres and above. Um, I don't want people to use individual pixels as gospel. Um, and I, I definitely don't want folks to use our maps as the authoritative data, especially going into any kind of management or stewardship decision making. You need to have a consulting forester. You need to be on the ground. But perhaps these maps and data can be really helpful. But it does give us an ability to estimate roughly, or at least relatively speaking, what a lot of these small parcels might be doing. And I hear from a lot of landowners over the last couple of years in the circle, I've only got you know, 14 acres, I'm told I can't do anything. Well, hopefully some of what we've developed can allow them to be part of these programs that can support the aggregation of multiple small parcels into whether it's an offset or an easement or some other type of voluntary agreement. Um, but that's the best answer I can give you, Ron. I, we, we are working on um, gathering from our partners inventory data that's truly independent at stand and parcel levels. And we're trying to use that to better estimate uncertainty um, against what other folks have measured on their land um, so that we can continue to provide really meaningful estimates of uncertainty based on the size of a parcel or of any given area that you're talking about. Um, it's like Norman and, and a great conversation with Peter Woodbury. Uh, Kirsten, Celine, it's been a long time. Um, I don't know if you remember meeting me, but I remember meeting you. The Hamilton County LIDAR that found faulty um, and you said data available now and seem to be. So the issue with that, Kirsten, and I can get into that more, and I've been meaning to send this to Bill Farber, my friend and, and, and colleague up there. Um, they flew about two thirds of that Hamilton County mission in July. It was supposed to be leaf off. Um, <laughs> I can tell you as somebody who lived in Fairbanks for several years, Fairbanks, Alaska, even at the northernmost reaches of our continent, there are leaves on trees in July. So they had some real issues. Um, the, the data has some real issues. And I actually have a few slides that I can show you on that. 
um, and happy to follow up on that some more. But the issue that we have with the Hamilton County LIDAR is that the contractor did not do a very good job. Um, and uh, so thank you, everybody. I appreciate your feedback. And can you show the summary slide again? That was only up about three seconds. Um, Ron, I'm not sure if you're talking about this one or maybe this one. Um, happy to get into that again. I don't know if, um, let's see. Thank you all for the comments. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Junk was putting it nicely. <laughs> Uh, hey, we've got to appreciate the forest land that we have and work to improve it, right? Let's not let's not insult it too much. We, but yeah, I agree with you. That there's a lot um, to do. Um, any evaluation of the impacts of climate change on forest biomass? Um, I think that's Carl. That's a great question. Um, you know, we don't have answers on that yet. You know, looking at the, if if you consider extreme weather. Uh, if you consider expanding insect populations or in, intensifying outbreaks, um, if you look at those things as a impact of climate change, then that's one thing that we can look at more carefully with what we've done. Talking about gradual or, or more subtle changes in growth rates, um, then we start to get into some really complicated stuff in terms of competitive relationships amongst plants, the ability for different tree species to tolerate changing conditions, and you don't want my forest ecology lecture on that topic, I'm sure, but it is a really important question. Um, overall, we have a warming and wetting climate, although flash droughts are becoming more common. Um, a warmer and wetter climate in our part of the world should lead to more rapid growth, but chances are it's not gonna be that simple. Um, so regeneration based on past data will have to be modified to account for deer browsing. We have no saplings in the understory. Yeah, new clearings here now populated by invasive shrubs and vines, not by forest species. Very good point. Um, we have to pick that out better. Um, and there are some tools with some better satellite imagery. Um, you know, as Peter and I were talking about right before we started, buckthorn, which is a big culprit here, it keeps its leaves on very late into the year. Really, the first heavy frost takes the leaves off. We can use satellite imagery to detect that. Um, honeysuckle leaves out a little bit early. We can potentially use that. It's a little harder. Uh, certainly in areas killed by uh, emerald ash borer, we have a lot of creeper and other vines coming in, um, and that's problematic too. So yeah, I mean the 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 issues of regeneration. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a key topic for us. The main thing that we're trying to figure out right now at this high level is is the land regenerating somehow, or was it did it go from a forest to some other land use? That's a key distinction that, I, that, that we can make. We're trying to automate, more formalize that process. And then once we're able to identify areas where regeneration is occurring, then we can dig a bit more deeper into actually what is regenerating on the site. But honestly, there's really no substitute for field work for doing that. So um, Let's see, will modeling future account for the grassland created by solar farms and the soil organic matter accumulation? Um, John, that's a good question. Maybe if somebody asks us to do that. <laughs> My main thing right now is I'm hearing from soil and water conservation district folks around the state. Um, we had 80 acres of, of forest, mature forest cleared for solar. There's three more projects of that size planned in the next few years. What are we gonna do? I'm not anti-solar by any stretch of the imagination, but clearing forest land for solar um, is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, and I think we can identify with these maps and, and related tools where other parcels of land, some of these old fields, these marginal transitional underutilized lands may be available and suitable for solar at the additional cost of having to run the infrastructure out to the grid. Maybe the state gets involved or other groups get involved and put the money where the, the, the needs to be to subsidize the use of the land um, that's further away from the grid, but is not going to clear a mature forest. Um, from a carbon standpoint, clearing a mature forest to put in a solar farm creates a debt that the solar farm may not be able to actually offset throughout its functional life. 
And so that's an important thing that we need to think about. And we don't want to lose the forest land, right? And so I'm not anti-solar or anti-wind. I'm anti-forest loss. Um, thanks for your comments, everybody. I think Peter, um, great point from Peter in terms of uh, future climate. We make some predictions about climate effects on growth. Um, much harder to predict pests and pathogens, how they are affected by climate and other changes. And I agree with you, Peter. I think as, you know, I, I think I mentioned, but I'll say again, we can see it as it's happening and we can look retrospectively and say, how is this changing, right? Are we seeing increasing insect damage? What impact is that having on our forest carbon sink? Um, is that related to climate? There's certainly some relationship there, but it's also related to other things. Um, yep. Chemung County and Tompkins have seen large solar farms placed on former hayfields and pastures. Good income. Absolutely. You know, again, I'm not anti-solar um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just anti-clearing forests for solar. Um, so I think I got through all of the questions. I'm happy to um, spend a little bit more time. I'm sure all of you are probably tired of hearing my voice. So I don't know if there's anything else, but thank you all for your attention and, and your really thoughtful questions. Colin. Thank you again. You did get through all the questions uh, and did a great job with those. And and thank you to the audience. I mean, those were some, those were um, more high level, I'm not saying that very well, higher level questions than what we usually get. So this was, a, I think, a pretty informed audience that was participating today. So thank you for your time. And uh, if you want to see this again, Colin will be <laughs> back at seven o'clock tonight. So get your bowl of popcorn and cocoa, given that it's cold. And uh, we'll see every. I'll, I'll see Colin for sure then, uh, and maybe some of you. So thank you all. all. Right. Thank you all. Thank you, Peter. See you thank later. Thank you, Colin. Yes, indeed. Bye.